Hi, this is Professor Wells back with you to uh, present another mini lecture um, about an architectural wonder that you can find in present day Turkey um, in the city of Istanbul. But when this magnificent church uh, was built, uh, that city was known as Constantinople, and that was the capital of what was to become the um, Eastern Roman Empire, which would eventually be known as the, the Byzantine Empire, which we've been studying so far in our unit in the art history of the ancient world. So um, I want to give you a tour of uh, this famous church, Hagia Sophia, and um, explain some of the innovations that really re make this one of the most remarkable um, holy spaces uh, to this day. It is now a mosque. Um, however, it is uh, just like the Parthenon in Athens, the most recognizable building on the horizon of uh, the cityscape of, of Istanbul. So um, without further ado, let's kind of remember where we were with the Byzantine Empire. All right, moving to my PowerPoint here. All right. Um, as you re might remember, we um, were exploring already the story of the famous power couple of the Byzantine Empire, Justinian, Emperor Justinian, um, presented in a detail of this magnificent mosaic we studied earlier. Um, along with his wife, Theodora, of course, reigned from Constantinople that you can see what was in the ancient world known as um, you know, part of Asia Minor. But as this map indicates, the Byzantine Empire um, eventually spread um, quite far and extensively to um, all directions, to you know, northwest, south, um, um, and east, um, as it uh, succeeded where the greater Roman Empire had collapsed. We had talked previously about the western part of the Roman Empire um, being mired in chaos and civil unrest, and so um, a switch in uh, power centers took place and gave um, uh, sort of seeded what was to become the, the Byzantine Empire. So um, it endured a good thousand years, um, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't trouble um, from time to time. In fact, in Constantinople, there were enemies that attacked the city at one point, and Justinian wanted to flee, to abandon the city, um, to save you know his life and uh, the fellow citizens of, of Constantinople and Theodora. Um, whom you might remember here. I think I have a, a slide of Theodora, a little detail shot of her rendered in a portrait in the form of a mosaic, um, convinced her husband, we're going to stay put, we're going to defend the city and fight off the enemy, and they were victorious. So what happened, though, however, is that a very famous church that stood up at this very location, this is a modern photo of present-day Istanbul and the church we're going to be focusing on, Hagia Sophia. I'll show you that name in just a minute. Um, but um, it, was, it was destroyed um, during that conflict. And so a new one had to be built. Again, not unlike the story of um, the temple dedicated to Athena in um, ancient Athens, the Parthenon. Uh, when it too was destroyed, sometimes a, a, way, a means through which to build solidarity among your population is to rebuild something so um, spiritually important and um, a focal point for a community. And that's what happened in Constantinople as well. So, you know, this wasn't the only church Justinian uh, built. As you can see, he, as a Christian emperor, we are in the era of Christianity at this point, he um, was uh, abundantly busy building more than 30 churches during his time as uh, the Byzantine Empire, Empire's most famous ruler. Um, so what you see here is this once Christian church. Um, you, those of you who are uh, familiar um, with Islam might recognize these um, pointed towers um, as a later addition. Um, uh, to call people to prayer if you are of um, Muslim faith when it was converted into a mosque. Um, some of these beefier elements that you see kind of pressed up 
um, against the building. Those are buttresses. They don't nearly have the elegance of what's to come in the future when we get to Gothic art. Uh, but essentially, they're almost like bookends, kind of holding or girdling um, the cascading wave that is channeling down um, from this incredible dome, which is the church's most remarkable feature. So those were added later as well. But let's take a peek inside, and you're going to see why this is such a, a glorious um, a spiritual space. Um, some of the details for you for note-taking. Hagia Sophia is the name of this particular church. Um, and it literally translates to the Church of the Holy Wisdom. Um, again, the location in ancient times, in the Byzantine era, um, was Constantinople. We know it now as Istanbul in Turkey. And again, the minarets or those bell towers were added later when it became a mosque, um, which it presently is. It was re, um, I guess, patriated into a mosque status. Um, and again, those baptisms were added later. But again, let's let's explore this enormous dome. Domes are a huge accomplishment. We saw, of course, the Romans um, pull this off at the uh, Pantheon in Rome. What happened at Hagia Sophia? Well, we need to take a look at an architectural plan to kind of understand what's going on here. Now, we have been exploring um, two kind of branches of church building um, based, you know, that sprung from the early Christian days. Um, one would be a longitudinal design um, where you have more of a traditional church in the shape of a, a crucifix like old St. Peter's or many of your neighborhood churches um, here in the United States and elsewhere. But then some of the Eastern Orthodox churches, even today, have a more of a central plan design, meaning not necessarily that they're circular, but they have a central focus and perhaps they're capped by a dome. Now, Hagia Sophia is interesting because um, this church is a little mixed bag of both traditions. Um, you can see the large, kind of almost like bullseye circular shape of that enormous dome that we saw from the exterior view. Um, but unlike some of our more traditional central design plans where you find that maybe the width and the length are equal ratios, this church, here's the altar end of the church, is longer, here the, en the entrance would be on this side, than it is wide. So it's kind of a mix of both the longitudinal and central plan design in one building. Now, let's talk about dimensions inside here. Artist rendering of how it looks. Um, I'll come back to that slide in a minute. Let me show you this glorious slide. Um, this is a slide I enjoy showing. I'll come back to you here. Um, this is what the wow factor of Hagia Sophia is all about, that you have this enormous dome seemingly suspended on a halo of light made up of 40 windows. Um, this is where we start to see all of the vaults invented in the Roman Empire, um, whether, you know, barrel vaults or groin vaults, but particularly that hemispherical dome really allow those walls to get opened up for windows and bring in that light and light becomes a vocabulary word for spiritual experiences right it brings in kind of you know it's like a metaphor for heavenly divine light um radiating down into the sanctuary taking you to an otherworldly spiritual place so that's what is amazing about what's going on here now how is such an enormous dome um, possible. I'm just checking my notes here. Remember that um, that the dome um, is about 108 feet, 108 feet um, in diameter. Um, sure, that's not as large as the Pantheon stone, which was about 142 feet in diameter, um, but the Hagia Sophia dome sits higher off the ground by a good almost 40 feet, whereas uh, at 180 feet from um, the cr from the crown of the dome to um, the, the floor of the church, whereas at the Pantheon, uh, you might remember that it's only 142 feet, which you know can't say it's only. It's a remarkable achievement in the High Roman Empire. 
But, you know, the higher you build something, the more gravitational forces, you know, create a weight and a burden of weight that architects and engineers in the, in the Byzantine world had to solve. How do they solve this? How do they not have this crashing to the ground? This looks completely fragile and brittle. You know, if you ever have, you know, perforated paper, we know how easily it tears. That's the idea. Well, there's an architectural um, invention that is has its history and origin in Mesopotamia, but it's really the Byzantine world that, um, I guess, solidifies it as a successful solution to a problem like this. And it's called a pendentive. So you can see that word right here. Okay, so I have two examples. The example on the right is an example of a pendentive. The example on the left is kind of the old way of doing things. So um, if you wanted a domed structure, Think Santa Costanza, the early kind of um, examples of architecture um, that we looked at in late antiquity. You know, you might have a square or box shaped building um, and you basically slap a dome on. It's almost like, you know, flipping a salad bowl upside down and placing it on there, and the four walls will support the weight of that dome. True with a drum shaped building, too, like the, like the Pantheon. On the right here, this is what is going on here. So the pendentives um, are um, curved triangular shaped elements and they have four points. We just can't see the, the point on the back here, but the four points um, channel the weight from the dome to big solid piers um, that are delineated in basically the four corners of Hagia Sophia. So instead of using walls to support the weight of a dome. They're using pendentives to channel that weight to these points and taper that weight and channel that weight down to the ground through um, th solid piers. So to me, I explain it to my classes is it's like a giraffe. You go to the zoo, you look at the giraffes, you have a gigantic uh, animal and yet all of that weight of that animal is successfully channeled down those slender legs, right? You don't see giraffes tripping. There, it's a, it's a, you know, Mother Nature's um, engineering miracle in terms of animal design, and that's what we see with the pendentives. So, because of the pendentives, the weight is successfully transferred to the piers instead of the walls, allowing windows to make the dome appear to float on a ring of divine light. So let's get back to that image here. And you can just make out the pendentives right here. Here's one, here's two. The piers are here. And we can't see the ones on the other side of this photo, but you get the idea. Here we back up a little bit and you can get a little bit more of a sense of the four pendentives here. One, two, three, four. And then, of course, this incredible dome with this miraculous light pouring into that sanctuary as if it's hovering on a, you know, suspended divine halo of light. So with, you know, Byzantine chants and the burning of incense, um, you can imagine yourself transported to a heavenly realm and, of course, connecting with your faith even more strongly, whatever your faith may be in that particular space. All right, uh, thanks for joining me. And I'll talk to you soon about more art from the ancient world.